Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. Today, we're going to look at another horrific situation with you. After committing the horrible act, Victor Alexander Pucherl carelessly went to the home of his girlfriend's father, Reyna, claiming to be looking for lost children's clothing. He seized a tablet belonging to one of the abused females and pawned it at a neighboring pawn shop for approximately 500 pesos. The next day, he spent the equivalent of $10 while on vacation with his best friend, Crystal, at the beach. During the outing, he admitted that he had done something wrong to his sweetheart, but did not provide any specifics. Crystal later stated that Victor's tone, words, and expressions hinted at the gravity of the situation. She allegedly sought to visit the house to see if Reyna and her children were okay. Victor, on the other hand, declined the visit, citing the disorder and the family's terrible emotional milieu. That was enough for the girl to conclude that she had done her best in the circumstances. Crystal did not report to the police. Concerned neighbors phoned the authorities after the smell of decomposition radiating from Reyna and Victor's home grew too intense to ignore or explain with rotting waste or dead animals on the property. The intense, nauseating odor was clearly emanating from the newly relocated couple's home, where flies gathered around the windows. Reyna and Victor had only recently moved into the house and had not yet become friends with the neighbors, so no one had their phone numbers or any other way to contact them. Furthermore, it had been several days since anyone had seen Reyna, Victor, or the children. Concerned neighbors contacted 911 after being unable to contact the homeowners and smelling a foul odor. A few hours after the call, law enforcement agents picked the lock and entered the house. Inside, they were met with a very awful sight. Reyna and her children's four motionless bodies. Reyna's girls were discovered in a room next to their mother while her son was found hanging from a closet rung. It's unknown how the press got there so quickly, but no sooner had the cops identified and located the man who lived with Reyna than a report with horrific facts about the family's death aired on one of the big metropolitan TV channels. So, while working in his workshop, Victor Alexander Putrell learned that police had broken into his home and discovered the dead of four victims. When he realized he was about to be jailed, he sent a message to the workshop owner. I ended the life of the person I loved the most. She loved me with all of her heart and I loved her back, a perfect love without any disputes. This is an extremely sad story. In communications to Miguel Urena Marancini, he handed on the contacts of Reina's relatives and asked them to forward them to the police. He said that he solely trusted Miguel, that he truly regretted what had transpired, and that he had requested him to transmit his final wish to the motorcycle gang. He wishes to leave as a biker with a massive motorcycle escort during the funeral. The last communication Victor sent to Miguel said, Now I don't believe anyone. Everybody wants to save me, but it won't happen. I am leaving this terrible world. I don't care what happens. I am leaving. See you later. Miguel Urena reported to the police that his friend had committed suicide. Law enforcement officials located Victor's cell phone and responded to the spot. Victor Alexander Puterol did nothing to himself. Furthermore, he didn't even consider it. He didn't feel any remorse or guilt for what transpired. The individual was aware that he would be apprehended and in some ways planned his arrest to ensure his safety. He gathered his belongings in his rucksack and proceeded to a little park near the workshop. For a while, he sat pensively on the sidewalk beside the park. A passerby approached him and inquired if he needed assistance. He shook his head from side to side and replied that he was all right before standing up, walking into the park and lying down on the grass. Victor remained down on the grass. Victor remained in this position for about an hour, gazing serenely at the sky and placing his hands behind his head. Around 8 a.m., a national police vehicle arrived. He did not move or resist arrest. The arrest lasted less than five minutes. Reina Isabel Incarnation was born in 1985. After the father abandoned the family but continued to support his ex-wife and daughter, Reina's mother then met another man, and the girl got a stepfather who was practically her father. Reina had a strong attachment with her mother's new husband while maintaining a positive relationship with her biological father. Both men 
treated her with kindness and concern, Reyna grew up to be. A curious and energetic child, she loved learning and attending school. Her father's house was nearby, and she saw him frequently. This brilliant and pleasant youngster appeared to have a bright future ahead of her. Reyna enrolled in university after graduating from high school and began her studies in commercial law. At the same time, she applied to the Autonomous University of Santo Domingo with the goal of acquiring a second degree in medicine, but she was denied admission and had to postpone her dream until the next year. When Reyna turned 20, she met Daniel Bowden, a man much older than her. Despite their considerable age difference, a passionate spark formed between them. Reyna became pregnant a few months into their relationship after which the pair married. This relationship produced three children, Daniela, Arachmina, and Angela. Reyna had to give up her dream of pursuing a second higher education. Reyna and Daniel's marriage appeared idyllic at first, but as time passed, the age gap began to have an impact on their relationship, resulting in frequent disagreements. Daniel understood that their continual arguments were harmful to their children, so the couple decided to split up after eight years of marriage. A long court struggle occurred, largely over child custody. Family court specialists intervened when the parties were unable to achieve an agreement on their own. They decided to conduct a psychological evaluation to help the youngsters figure out who they wanted to live with. The specialists determined that the father should be the guardian, taking into account his age, financial status, and the opinions of his elder children. However, the judge who made the ultimate decision ignored the expert's suggestions and gave Reyna custody of the elder children. Angela, Daniel's youngest daughter, was to be raised by one of his sisters. Tragically, this decision denied the children not just a future, but also their lives. The years that followed shown that the judge should have accepted the recommendations of experts. Reyna's conflict turned out to be about alimony rather than the children. After receiving custody of the elder children, she quickly gave them over to her mother, believing this was the best option for everyone. She subsequently filed a fresh court fight about alimony payments. Reyna stated that her ex-husband did not pay her. Any of the court ordered money. Daniel argued that he had fulfilled his responsibilities but could not offer documentation, stating that the payments were paid in cash. The legal battle lasted several months and ended in the mother's favor, with Daniel paying further alimony. During the second court hearing, Reyna's mother testified in favor of her former son-in-law, Daniel. She believed Daniel was a wonderful and conscientious father who deserved better treatment. She underlined that he and her daughter had spent eight wonderful years together, with Daniel being a nice, responsible husband and parent. This is not to argue that Reyna abandoned her children totally. She visited them virtually every day at their grandmother's house and took them to her home on weekends. The remainder of the time, she enjoyed life to the fullest, making up for lost youth. At one of the events, she met her new love, Victor Alexander Paturiel. It's difficult to comprehend what drew the young woman to Victor. He was two years younger than Reyna. On the one hand, Victor created a strong first impression as a mystically inclined young man with long black hair and sparkling white contact lenses, a biker and metalhead. On the other hand, he was a filthy, unkempt, reclusive and insecure man. These anomalies did not dissuade the girl. The pair fell in love and soon moved in together. Reyna's mother accepted Victor. The young man won her over with his affability and several stories about difficult life situations he had encountered. He frequently and in detail described his difficult childhood. When his mother abandoned him in the hands of a strict and severe father, unfortunately manipulating the maternal instinct did not notify the children's grandma. On the contrary, it made her like the manipulator more. Victor was born in 1987. He did spend his early years with his father. It is unclear if he was cruel to him. Victor learned to adapt to circumstances that were hard for him, and no one in his surroundings noticed anything unusual about him except his appearance. Victor was never involved in a conflict since he was a child. He thrived in school, graduating with honors. He couldn't go to university since his parents couldn't afford it. As a result, he began seeking for work 
and quickly landed an internship at a motorcycle maintenance business. Since then, motorcycles have become his passion. Victor eventually got a Harley Davidson motorcycle and joined the subculture of motorcycle lovers and supporters. Victor, a calm, law, hiding man with no history of even a parking ticket, terrified those around him. He was constantly dressed in black, had eye makeup, painted nails, and frequently wore white contact lenses. Very rarely would his controls fail, revealing the hidden beast. Following the incident, a neighbor described how he unintentionally spotted Victor Powderall while catching a neighbor's chicken, slicing its throat, and drinking the hot blood right from the bird's wounds. Reyna and Victor took the kids on weekends and occasionally on weekdays. The grandparents were relieved to have a break from their three noisy and busy grandchildren. That their daughter's new spouse was caring and attentive to the children, Reyna never complained to her parents about Victor and they never appeared to disagree, which pleased her parents much. The sole blemish on this perfect setting was a distressing piece of information they had accidentally discovered. Victor had a 10-year-old daughter, and her biological mother had gotten a restraining order prohibiting Victor from approaching the youngster, from approaching the youngster. Raina's parents didn't comprehend why her mother would do such a thing. Raina's stepfather followed Victor about several times, but discovered nothing strange or suspicious. The young man did not consume alcohol or illegal drugs, and he was either at home or at work servicing motorcycles. He was never harsh to the kids, even when left alone with them. In other words, despite suspicions, he appeared to be a normal person. Raina's parents dismissed the restraining order as her biological mother's eccentricities and calmed down. The story concluded when the aunt who had been caring for the youngest daughter Angela informed Reyna that she could no longer care for her. Around the same time, Reyna's mother developed health problems, forcing the grandchildren to relocate from their grandmother's home to Reyna and Victor's. Suddenly, the five of them found themselves in a small flat. However, the circumstances were extremely favorable. Reyna was offered a new position with a greater pay, and the reunited family moved into a large rented property with numerous separate rooms. A wonderful family life began with a huge house. Loving spouses and children living with their mother. Isn't that an indication that everything was going well? Perhaps it was. But Reyna soon lost her work and the family experienced financial troubles. According to Victor's mother, she had to provide financial support to the young couple because they didn't have enough money for food or rent. Meanwhile, Reyna's mother remained unaware of her daughter's struggles. Reyna only brought the children to her mother's house on rare occasions, and she asked her grandma to feed them generously, which she gladly did. In addition to the financial troubles, the couple began to experience odd and clearly unhealthy behavior. Reyna had never complained to anyone about anything, but their relationship was everything from normal. Victor appeared on. The street with short trimmed hair not long before the tragic events occurred. It turned out that the couple had a violent quarrel the night before, and Reyna had cut off his beautiful black hair in retaliation as he slept. Victor also testified that Reyna threatened to leave him with the children if he did not find a well-paying job within a month. On Saturday, February 3rd, 2018, Reyna went to her mother's house to pick up the children, who had been with their grandma since Thursday. Reyna's mother noticed nothing remarkable about her daughter's behavior. On the contrary, she was friendly and in a good mood. They had time to converse over a cup of tea as the kids packed their belongings. The following day, early Sunday morning, February 4th, the child and her mother had a brief phone, chat in which they discussed current events and planned to call each other later. Reyna never responded again. After repeated phone calls and text messages to her daughter and grandchildren, the mother called Victor, who also did not answer. So the quiet and ignoring of calls continued for several days. Finally, on Wednesday, February 7th, Victor responded. He assured them that everything was in order and that Reyna would call back shortly to discuss everything in detail. He advised her not to worry and to wait for the call. The daughter never phoned back. It was evident to the parents that something dreadful had occurred. A day later, they received a call from law enforcement agents who told Reyna's parents the horrific details of what had occurred. Victor Alexander began testifying. Shortly following his arrest, he did not hide anything and did not expect mercy. 
According to him, he decided to terminate his life, but then changed his mind, believing that he should pay for his actions. The thorough evidence allowed for a nearly complete restoration of the timeline of events. On Sunday morning, February 4th, the roommates had another heated argument in their shared bedroom. Victor struck Reyna numerous times on the neck, chest, and stomach, causing her death. He then locked her body in the room and sent Reyna's oldest kid, Daniela, to the store, telling her to get him a pack of cigarettes. While the girl was gone, Victor went into the children's room and strangled Reyna's daughter with a necktie while she was sleeping. When Daniela returned from the store, he treated her exactly like he had treated her sister. He then moved the children's remains into the bedroom he shared with Reyna. At the moment, young Araman was peacefully playing in the small courtyard behind the home. Victor approached the youngster and told him that his elder sister had gone to the market and it was too late, so he would take him to his aunt's house and then seek for Daniela. Araman obediently followed Victor to his aunt Johanna Mendoza Coelho's residence. The man left the youngster alone and returned to the house, trying to cover the consequences of his actions. It appears that it wasn't until he went home that he understood he couldn't hide the truth and that it would inevitably be disclosed. A few hours later, he returned for the boy and informed his aunt that Daniela had been located and that it was time to return home. Victor killed Airman at home by hanging him from a rung in a closet. The man said that he committed this act because they were all in a bad financial condition that he was psychologically unable to deal with. Victor's associates acknowledged that he had recently complained about financial problems among family members. Victor's mother informed detectives that her son's financial problems had pushed him to despair and compelled him to commit such a terrible crime. The couple was already in a critical condition, which was aggravated over the weekend when they did not get their scheduled income. Mrs. Joanna Mendoza, the accused's aunt, believes that the situation in which my son, a young man, was being requested money from a mother and her children pushed him over the brink. However, the crime's extraordinary ferocity did not fit with a condition of mental illness. The preliminary autopsy report highlighted the issue, revealing that all of the female victims were not only killed, but also mistreated. An investigation by the public prosecutor's office revealed that the victim, Reina Isabel Encarnacion, had regularly expressed concerns to the accused on WhatsApp about the inappropriateness of intimate activities against Angela while she was sleeping. In one of the most recent communications, the woman threatened to report her cohabitant to the police. Reina's mother informed the police that the jailed young guy had always treated the three daughters properly, but he had a unique bond with Angela. He carried her in. His arms, frequently placing her on his lap and hugging and kissing her. He even created a particular moniker for her. Investigators believe Victor killed the family members to conceal his wrongdoings against Angela rather than due to money issues. Forensic evidence revealed that Reyna, as well as the two girls, had been wrongly abused. The specialists were unable to ascertain whether the improper acts were perpetrated before or after their deaths because the bodies were discovered at a late state of decomposition. A psychiatric test revealed that Victor had antisocial personality disorder, which means he lacks both guilt and conscience. The horrible crime angered and appalled the whole Dominican community. The trial began in January 2019 and concluded in just two days. Experts and forensic experts testified, as did detectives and numerous witnesses, with Victor's pals providing the most information. For example, Crystal, the defendant's best friend, claimed that on the day of his detention, he handed her all of his social media passwords and his mother's telephone number. According to her, it appeared that the young man intended to quit his life. Another acquaintance of the young guy claimed that Victor confessed the crime to him in detail a few days before his arrest, but the confession was so horrific that the friend misinterpreted it as a joke. In general, everyone who had ever seen or met the accused was astounded by his actions. Neighbors, instructors, and co-workers all recognized him as a quiet guy with a distinct appearance, nothing more. He didn't appear combative, was not regarded as a brawler and, according to them, never spoke poorly of people. He wasn't really social. Victor's only diagnosis as a child was attention deficit disorder. Although, according to his mother, the ailment caused no problems for the family or him. The trial featured 18 witnesses, including two forensic experts. The latter offered such horrifying facts 
that Victor's mother requested that the full weight of the law be applied to her son. Justice must be served, and he must bear the consequences of his actions. She said this in court. She begged Raina's family to forgive her for having such a boy and felt their sorrow. Victor Alexander Putrell pled guilty in court to killing Raina Isabel Incarnation and her three children. He also apologized to the victim's family and the whole public for the crime. I acknowledge the facts. However, not all that was stated occurred exactly as represented. I realize I can't go back in time and restore the lives I took. I sincerely apologize to the community and all family members for what occurred. I contributed to my arrest because I recognized that by killing myself, I would not be able to pay for my acts, Victor Putro remarked calmly. The individual received the most severe sentence available at the time in the Dominican Republic's judicial system, 30 years. He was just 30 years old when the sentence was issued, which meant that under the right circumstances, he could be released from prison and live the remainder of his life freely. This potential prompted the National Congress to speed forward revisions to the criminal law. The country's code, enacted in 1844, prohibits cumulative punishment for successive crimes. Victor Alexander could have received a sentence of up to 60 years in prison if the new criminal code, which is presently being debated in the National Congress, had been in place. The death of Reina and her children highlighted the need to replace the code as soon as feasible. Nonetheless, justice prevailed. The culprit received the maximum penalty. Reina's mother, speaking on several media programs, claimed that she was pleased with the outcome of the case. The biological father of the three abducted children is still unable to comprehend what happened. He claimed that the catastrophe involving his children would not have occurred if the judge had listened to the experts and granted him custody 